there are many things I enjoy outside of work. Smashing a workout at the gym, flowing in a yoga class, or just simply taking a nice long walk. But as a 30-something, I can't help but start to wonder how drastically different my life would be if I weren't able to do any of these things. I could be hit with a major health episode, a chronic illness or a condition that impairs my mobility. Most importantly, would I be able to afford the care I need? And what can I do now to make sure I'm prepared for future healthcare expenses? Hello! Hello, hi! Hi, hi, hi! Thanks for having me. Okay, hi. This is Madam Hariati. Three years ago, she had to undergo a partial knee replacement surgery when she was in her late 40s. Much to her surprise. Every time when I walk, it will cause a lot of pain. You, know? you feel like the bones is brushing against. An x-ray revealed her knee cartilage had worn away and she needed surgery. I think the last time you were telling me you were able to do a half <coughs> squat or a full squat already. Yeah? Just half, not full, half only. Can I see? Can you stand up and show me? Okay, that's good. Knee replacements are actually one of the more common surgeries in NUH and AH. We are looking at more than 1,000 of these cases annually. So why are there more and more Singaporeans undergoing this particular surgery? Last time it was about working your whole life, but then expectations on what we want in our latter years have actually gone up. Whether it's family time, joining that salsa dance class that you never had time to do, we have seen many different advancements in the technology, the way the surgery is done. Not so long ago, patients meet in the market, then they'll be telling each other, oh, it's such a painful experience. Now with modern anesthesia techniques, better pain management methods, instead of having to suffer in the hospital for over a week, two or three days' time, they'll say to you, Doc, I'm, I'm okay, I can manage at home. While her bills were mostly covered by subsidies and insurance, medical advancements do come at a price. Treatments have gotten more expensive. 10 to 15 years ago, the knee implants were costing between three to three and a half thousand. Today, we are looking at the implants costing at about four and a half to five thousand. The materials are better, the implants are more anatomical, and so the prices have gone up. And that's not all that's contributing to rising healthcare costs. Higher operating expenses are also putting pressure on hospitals. What are some of these categories of cost? Manpower forms a large portion of um, healthcare delivery costs. It accounts for about 60%. And then we do have another 20% coming from drugs and consumables, as well as um, IT system related costs. What's been driving up um, the labour costs in your hospital? There is actually a shortage of manpower. It actually pushes up the wage with inflation as well. Drugs is a big component of cost. We are also switching from branded to generic drugs without impacting the efficacy of the drugs. So if you look at this too, by switching to the generic, um, you can see a reduction of about 20% in overall cost. And this actually gets translated into the price that the patient pays. So here you see this is actually a smart bed. We have contactless sensors. They can actually capture the patient's um, vitals. If it is out of range, it will signal by turning red and then the nurses can actually come by to check. In a traditional ward, one nurse handles five beds. But in this smart ward, they can manage six, boosting efficiency by 20%. In other words, hospitals are doing what they can to manage costs. But some factors remain outside their control. An ageing population is one of them. Today, one in five Singaporeans is over the age of 65. However, very rapidly, we will move into a time when one in four Singaporeans will be older than the age of 65. As the population collectively ages, we then have many more individuals who have chronic disease, and this then imposes a very heavy burden on the healthcare system. One study in the US shows that the average healthcare spending of those aged 65 and above is 2.5 times higher than the average spending of a working adult. With rising costs, some of us are probably thinking, why isn't healthcare fully covered by the government? Or, why can't we just get more subsidies? To answer this, we first need to understand who's footing the healthcare bill. In Singapore, it's paid for through a mix of 1. 
subsidies, which are funded with government revenues such as taxes. 2. MediShield Life, a national health insurance scheme funded by the premiums you and I pay. And 3. MediSafe, which are our own compulsory savings. But why use different methods to cover costs? When we have many more mechanisms or buckets to pay for healthcare, the system then becomes more really resilient. Think of it as, as an aeroplane with four engines rather than with two engines. If one is down, then the other could then step up. Why yep. can't healthcare be completely free? I think almost certainly in a world where anything is free, there will be overconsumption. We will spend more on medicines than we would actually need. Doctors and their patients choose the most expensive interventions when a less expensive one would do just as well. We'll get more unsustainable even more quickly. Why can't we have more subsidies if healthcare costs are rising? If the individual gets more subsidies, I think inevitably we will have to accept that there will be more taxes. It may be direct, GST, income tax, or it may be indirect. As a matter of fact, the government has been spending more and more in recent years on subsidies for medical care. What happens when a system relies entirely on private insurance or allowing residents to just buy insurance to pay for healthcare? That society is bifurcated, is split into the haves and the have-nots. For the haves, mm -hmm. they will have much greater access to interventions, to specific drugs or therapies that may not be available to those who do not have insurance. But in Singapore, everybody is covered by insurance, thanks to MediShield Life. It's a mandatory basic health insurance plan against large medical bills for life, regardless of pre-existing conditions. However, it currently doesn't cover all conditions. It excludes non-essential and lower-cost treatment or services, such as consultations with a GP. Are there any other trade-offs for a healthcare consumer um, when it comes to expanding coverage for an issue like? The premiums would have to go up. The critical ratio in the insurance world is called the medical loss ratio. And this, in essence, reflects the ratio of the claims paid out versus the premiums collected. If the claims paid out are consistently larger than the premiums collected, the insurance scheme will run out of money. Simply put, we would have to accept higher premiums as a trade-off for expanded coverage. What all this means is that for Singaporeans to continue to have access to affordable healthcare, a fine balancing act is needed. The reality is that as a country, we are spending more each year on healthcare. About one-fifth of it comes out of our own personal pockets. The government accounts for more than half of all spending. For government spending, for example, in 2016, we spent about 10 billion. In 2023, that's about 18 billion. So, what is the government doing to help Singaporeans cope with rising healthcare costs? One, by reviewing MediShield Life so that it keeps up with healthcare costs. The effectiveness of the claim limits have eroded uh, over time. As the bill sizes go up, the claim limits remain stagnant and becomes inadequate for coverage. From April 2025, MediShield Life premiums were increased by up to 35% to allow for higher claim limits and expansion of coverage to include a wider range of treatment plans. We are seeing a wave of new therapies being developed. They're called cell and gene therapies. These developments do give hope to people with rare conditions. I think it is only right for a national insurance scheme to provide some support. New outpatient treatments and home-based medical care will also be added to the coverage. For example, today there are some patients, could be traffic accident patients or patients with congenital conditions, they need respiratory support system. And these ventilation systems can be provided in a hospital or they can actually be used at home. It helps manage healthcare costs because the cost of an inpatient stay uh, is a lot more than if they were to stay at home. Aside from updating MediShield Life to help deal with rising costs, there's also a body called the Agency for Care Effectiveness. It conducts technical evaluations that inform the government's financing coverage for clinically and cost-effective drugs, as well as medical technologies. About you know, 40 or 50 new drugs will enter the Singapore market each year, and uh, we do an evaluation of you know, which drugs uh, we should 
uh, subsidised. So we then say, okay, based on the uh, data that has been published so far, how clinically effective will this drug be? If I were to spend one million on this drug, how many more uh, healthy life years would I buy for the population? Her team also negotiates with companies to get the best prices for drugs and medical technologies. In the past, we were passive price takers. It means that the company comes to you and says that, OK, we're going to charge $1,000 for this drug. And we either say yes or no. So now we say that, OK, based on our um, analysis, you know, it's not very cost effective. Can you come back with a better price? Managing the cost of drugs isn't the only way to keep healthcare costs low. Where you get your treatment also makes a big difference. If you are ever hospitalised and become stable enough to leave, general practitioners like Dr. Kuma can help continue your care outside. When a person is ready to be discharged uh, from the hospital, we can carry on the management that is being instituted by the hospitals so that there's no break in the journey or the medical treatment. The shorter amount of time they spend in hospitals, the better in terms of cost. In short, choose the right care options for yourself. But even better, we can start taking preventive measures before a health episode hits us. One way to do so is to build a relationship with your family doctor. Hey, hey doc. How are you? <laughs> so these are home blood pressure readings, right? Yeah, that's right. We can see that your blood pressure is uh, on the higher end. You could probably be developing hypertension. You can try lifestyle management, meaning exercise, cut down your salt, diet control. We look after their health needs to make sure they lead a healthy life. We detect problems early and we can manage them. So right. if I were to come to you, right, today as a patient, saying, first time, yeah, first yeah. time, and I said, like, hey, you know what, I want to sign myself up, what would you be looking out for? So the first thing we do is go into your medical history. Then I would probably recommend according to your age mm -hmm. and the information that you have given me, I would recommend a screening right. uh, for certain medical issues that are common. We can't stop healthcare costs from rising, but I've learned two things. One, much is done behind the scenes to make sure that we get the best healthcare at the lowest possible cost. And two, I can take action to make better informed choices about my medical care. As well as stay healthy to reduce my chances of needing that care so I can keep doing what I enjoy most.